to introduce uh, the first speaker that you have in the, in the agenda of the forum. And we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Gerardo Jiménez Sánchez. We appreciate very much his effort. I told, I told you before, because he's coming uh, from Mexico. He's always working uh, or sharing his time between Mexico and Harvard University. So Madrid was not in this route, Galicia less, but <laughs> uh, he, he loves Spain. I know that we're talking about this uh, last night in the, in the dinner, and he loves Galicia. So we are sure that he's happy to be here with us, and he's happy to share with us all his huge knowledge and experience in this area. He's going uh, to give us the, the opening speech about moving genomics to the clinic. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges in this movement, in this moment, and thinking not only in the present, thinking in the future. So thank you very much to be with us. And uh, I hand over to you. Thank you, Federico, for such kind words. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure to be in Spain. It's always a pleasure to be in Spain. And it's a particular pleasure to be in Santiago, where I first came in 1993 as a pilgrim and I did enjoy all the way down from uh, the vast country to this beautiful city uh, where I always like coming back. So it is an honor to be here today and share with you uh, the celebration for the 10th anniversary of the Roche Institute. <clears throat> and so in that sense, I would like to extend my congratulations to all the personnel from the Roche Institute for this tremendous work that has been nourishing the development of genomic medicine, personalized medicine, particularly in Spain. And I particularly like to thank my, my good friend, uh, Jaime del Barrio, whom I met when I was uh, initiating my term as director of the National Institute of Genomic Medicine down in Mexico. And, he, and they were starting here uh, the Roche Institute in Spain. So we, we have certain parallelisms that, uh, that uh, take us way back. So having said that, and uh, I know by the way that today we have an audience, an audience with uh, pretty uh, uh, heterogeneous backgrounds. And so what I will be doing by uh, completing the task that I've been assigned to is to um, pull together some, um, some aspects of uh, genomics, uh, where we're coming from, where we stay, where we stay right now, where we stand at this point, and what are the uh, opportunities and challenges that um, we face to the future? And as we said, we heard before, these are not only scientific or technological um, uh, uh, challenges, but also other kinds of challenges: uh, economic, uh, political. Uh, public engagements, and so on, that we will be discussing today. But let me just take it from, from what I consider the beginning of this uh, recent era of genomics that you and I all remember when the Human Genome Project came to, to an end after uh, uh, 12 years and 14 years worth of work from people from around the world. And um, you, you well remember the uh, publication of the U.S. government-funded uh, Human Genome Project that came out in this um, historical number of, uh, of a Nature uh, journal uh, based uh, from where we, um, we were able to have uh, access, direct access, to the sequence of the human genome. And based on that, it was clear that it, was, it would open new opportunities uh, for science, for biology, for um, better learning molecular basis of human disease, and for, for public uh, health care as a whole. It wasn't clear, though, how we were going to get to this challenge, however, um, 
things ha ha happen in a way that make it clear now that we will eventually get there. So basically, what we, uh, the chapter that we will be discussing today is the one referring to genomic medicine that, in general, we can consider as this emerging um, discipline that involves using the individual genomics information as a part of the clinical care. We're beginning to do so right now, but I would say in a pretty rustic and primitive way, so if, if we just think as to how we envision that this will be happening in the future. So what we have and what we know for sure is the human genome sequence, and that's a done deal, and every day we have a better and better um, uh, version of this uh, sequencing map. However, where you and I want to get to is to the clinical practice. So question today here is how do we go from here to here? That's the big question, and how do we how do we do it safely? How do we do it ra rationally? How do we do it um, uh, making sure that this uh, genomic medicine help all and not uh, uh, increases the uh, difference, the gap between the rich and the poor, between the healthy and the diseased? So how do we do it responsibly um, through the next steps that are coming in our way? So what we know now is that DNA sequence, we have it for sure. Clinical practice, we don't quite get how we will get there. So there's clearly a promise to fulfill. And here I would like to um, discuss with you uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, domains that we believe are important to complete so that we can get uh, the path uh, from genome sequence to clinical care. So basically what we want to do, the question is how do we get from here to here? And there are basically, um, uh, I would propose that there are basically five domains that we need to cover before we get from here to here. And certainly the first one will be to understand in the structure of the genome. Indeed, we have a first draft of the human genome that has been uh, more and more uh, robust every day, uh, but that's not enough. We really want to understand not only the structure, but also the biology of uh, the genomes, not only the human genome, but genomes of other organisms that we are involved with. Once we have that, of course, it will be great to, to learn more about the uh, biology of the disease. What are the molecular mechanisms of disease and how do we got to understand what's behind a clinical framework that we face in our patients. And uh, the fourth uh, domain that uh, once we have that, of course, would be to advance in the science of medicine. How do we translate that knowledge into actionable uh, interventions that could benefit the health of our patient. And once we have that, hopefully, we will get to improving uh, in an effective way uh, healthcare, and it will, as it was say, said a few minutes ago. So this is a long path. We've done part of it. Uh, we've accomplished part of it in a pretty good way. Um, but, um, but there's still a lot of work to do. So first of all, to study the structure and the function of the human genome. Um, and uh, uh, you might remember the first uh, thing we move into once the, the sequence was published was to understand genetic variation amongst ancestral populations. That today sounds a little primitive, but it was extremely using, useful having, getting to know the HAP map of the human genome. And you might remember that the HAP map had the goal of uh, uh, mapping the human, uh, the uh, different haplotypes uh, on uh, common uh, patterns of uh, genetic variation. That is to say, identifying the different blocks in the human genome in three ancestral populations. And so for that, uh, NHGRI selected three populations um, to, which are representing uh, Africa, you might remember the Yoruban population, Asian represented by Han Chinese and Japanese, and Europeans represented by residents of Utah and the actual CEO population from Europe. So at this point, I was all very interesting. However, um, uh, in, my, in our group, in my country, we were concerned about not having the Latin American population represented. And of course, knowing the history of America, 
it was much bigger of a challenge identifying haplotypes in an admixed population as opposed to a pure, say, pure, quote-unquote, population. So we decided that add a Latin American chapter to the HAP map, and what we did, we sampled indigenous populations and mestizo populations from Mexico, uh, and these are some of the states where we sampled individuals from across uh, north, north, south, east, and west, and center, and I said, as I said before, we identify individuals, um, indigenous populations, and mestizo populations, and we took it very serious because uh, for those of, of of you uh, in the room, uh, you can tell by this slide, uh, this is the, con the consent form, and as I just learned that most of us speak Spanish, you will recognize that this consent form is not written in Spanish, but in different indigenous languages of Mexico, so that indigenous populations could learn what the human genome was, what the uh, haplotype map was about, and why was it important to give a sample of a, a blood sample to this. So once we, it, it took time, it took a lot of effort, and we genotype all these populations, and then we came back to the publication of the, uh, of the HAP map, and we can see here in this um, uh, components plot, uh, principal components plot, we see the European component in orange, which is a very uh, constrictive, uh, very well-defined population, the same with the European population, and the same for Chinese and Japanese. Although they're different, we could distinguish them. They were pretty much concentrated in a um, in a uh, specific area of this principal components plot. When we uh, plotted the mestizo population, and the reason we wanted to do this is because our idea was um, if there is a hat map from which there will be products and services, diagnostics and treatments, we want to be part of that. And the question was, due to our ancestry, ancestral history, will the, the Mexican genome be identical to any one of these? And the answer shows in this slide, when we plot the Mexicans we analyzed, turned out that uh, there was no group in which they will clearly fit, number one, they did not show a concentration as they did for other populations. It was a widespread of in, of, a, of a, um, a widespread range in which indeed one of the streams was uh, the European population, most likely the Spanish population, as one of the streams of the mestizo uh, population. Many people hypothesized at that time that the other end of the of the stream here would be the Asians who were seem to come to America and be uh, our ancestors. But it turns out that when we uh, map this out, the ones that were here were the Zapotecs. Those are indigenous, pure indigenous populations that clearly got away genetically from the ancestors, uh, Asian ancestors, and led to the other extreme of the mestizo population. So that clearly is shown in, 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 in a different way um, that indeed what happened what came from the HAP map wouldn't really apply directly to the Mexican population. And here we see uh, an experiment with, uh, with um, ancestry informative markers when we show in yellow those from a uh, European population, um, orange for Asian, green for Africans, and we included a blue for um, uh, indigenous populations from America. And when we observe here different populations from the different states of Mexico, north, south, east, and west, we observe that indeed there is a major component of European and indigenous populations across, not by the way of Asians uh, shown in yellow, there's a very tiny component, and a couple of states in Mexico showed some, um, some African component here. So clearly, uh, this was important because it did show that we could not just copycat from what happened in Europe and use it in Mexico to develop personalized medicine. And the same happens for other parts of the world. And so what we did, we pulled together a public database as they did with the, with, uh, with the, um, 
uh, human genome with a hat map, and we indicated in every single one of the SNPs, uh, indicated here by the RS uh, uh, code for every single one of the SNPs, uh, the three populations from the hat map, but we also included the Mexican population. Not only that, but we, br we, we made a breakdown of each one of them by state, and you can observe that minor allele frequencies might change from one state to another. And if these were minor alleles, related to health or drug response, this will, will be tremendously important for public health system in Mexico. So we did that all over the place, and with that, we accomplished at least uh, to know the step one, which is to know the structure of the human genome and the structure of variation by block in different populations, including ours. The next step, you might remember, um, started uh, a little later uh, at that time, which was uh, the task of producing a parts list of the human genome. That is to say, it was not enough to just have a list of genes or a sequence of DNA. We really needed to know about what was there. Because you might remember if, oh, from those in the audience who are not from the genetics field, uh, in the human genome, in this long two billion uh, letter sequence, there's only one to two percent of the genome that encodes for genes. For 98%, we really didn't know at that time what it was related to. And thus, at that time, uh, another major initiative was uh, launched, which is uh, uh, the ENCODE project, which was aimed to produce a, um, a uh, encyclopedia of all of the non-coding elements. Uh, it took nine years, and it was finally published in 2011. And it was, it was as I said, a part of this list uh, um, uh, not genes, but uh, uh, transcription factor binding sites, histone markers, regulatory elements, methylation re regions, RNA expression, and so on. So that gave us a way more complex map uh, showing that at least half of the human genome uh, serve as gene switches. There are several gene switches for most part of the human uh, a genome. So what we thought didn't, uh, was a junk DNA at that time, it really turned out to be uh, regulatory uh, uh, switches throughout. And this is the way we uh, can observe the uh, map out of ENCODE so by showing all the different pieces throughout the genome. And they get pretty complex. Through uh, the, through the genome uh, through uh, this, the genome as it becomes available. So now we had a much more robust base as to what where to work from. Uh, that, that was not only sequence haplotype distribution, but also part list of regulatory elements. And of course, there's been another area tremendously useful, which I won't get into detail, but we'll hear. Um, about it later down in the road today, which is beyond sequence. And that is to say changes, chemical changes in the sequence of DNA, namely epigenetics, either for methylations or chemical changes to the proteins associated with the packing of the DNA, namely histones. And there is a lot of knowledge that has come out of uh, epigenetics, which is a, a really important topic that actually has identified several pathways uh, related to uh, groups of disorders, such as uh, in the area of cancer, and even, though, and, and even more, there are now approaches to, uh, to developing drugs in this area to develop a specific uh, uh, components to um, to personalized medicine. So this is this, with this. I think we had a pretty good uh, raw material to start with by knowing sequence, haplotypes, ele regulatory elements, and epigenetics as a baseline uh, to start with. So. Back to the road as to how do we go from these now robust databases of elements into clinical care, we now needed to know and to learn more in detail genetic variation. It was clear from 1998 where SNPs were uh, identify in a systematic way for the first time, it was clear that we all share 99% of our human genome. However, the 0.1% of the human genome that we did not share 
it's composed of different kinds of variants, which out of which the most frequent are the changes from one letter to another that is single nucleotide polymorphisms, namely SNPs. And so the next step here was let's just need, we just need to learn what uh, uh, the genetic variation is and how does it look like so that we can we could tackle both the structure and the biology of the human genome. So, um, as I said before, this is the way we represent a segment of the DNA, and I'm shadowing here some, uh, just to indicate how uh, some regions are coding regions, namely genes, and some regulatory regions or intergenic regions uh, not shadowed in this slide. So, um, as I said, we learned that more and more that there are single nucleotide changes along the sequence, um, probably one in average every 800 nucleotides, and we learn how uh, our genome is uh, full of uh, single letter changes in uh, areas where nature tolerates them, and that was contributes to the uh, diverse uh, the uh, genetic diversity in the human in the human species that in um, in coordination with the with the with, with the environment leads to both our particular um, phenotypic features, but as well they gave us our chemical individuality. So these variants uh, are really important because some of them might lead to risk or protection to disease, or some of them might determine how we respond to a commonly used drug, and we'll see examples of this in, the, in a minute. But before that, uh, there was a major, another major initiative that today we all use more and more, which uh, turned out to be the Thousand Genomes Project. And that project, what it did was to uh, analyze a genetic variation in more detail. Not only SNPs, but insertions, deletions, and other changes, rearrangements through the human genome, particularly uh, variants that have to do with uh, copy number variants throughout the genome. This was a very much detailed um, uh, catalog of the human genome, and it, in this time, it included populations from, uh, it included 14 different populations from across the world, and really provided uh, a resource that we use every day around the world. It is a real um, baseline sequence that allows us to see what different variants are, and particularly useful when we believe we've discovered a variant that has to do with a disease, and it turns out uh, that we, we use this model to compare the sequences in our, in, in, in our experiments so that we can get a real data, uh, baseline of what we are analyzing. So after the uh, Thousand Genomes Project, which was, uh, which uh, uh, ended in 2011 and published a year later, uh, we learned that indeed we were able to analyze in detail the six, the six billion nucleotides that form in a full genome. Uh, we were also uh, uh, able to identify uh, three to five million single nucleotide variants, but also um, we identified certain variants that were not present in the, uh, in, in the database, and some of them were not even present in either parent, that is to say, uh, new mutations that arise in, uh, in our genome in every generation. Um, several, we now know that every genome carries about 10 to 20 structural variants, and we know now that everybody has um, between 10 and 10, uh, between 5 and 10 uh, mutants, mutations in uh, disease causing genes, and we carry them along with as a part of our uh, genetic baggage. So clearly there were some uh, disruptions that were uh, found, and, and also uh, it was known that about 20 genes are completely inactivated in every person. And so that made, uh, that gave us a real baseline and a list of variants out of which we can, uh, from around the world, that we can use uh, now to analyze the human genome in more detail. And as you will see in a minute, this becomes extremely robust when we're seeking for genes related to common disease. 
So back to our pathway into uh, uh, personalized medicine, we now know, so we now know the structure and we know some biology of the human genome. Now we know variation of the human genome, but the next challenge was let's just analyze that, those variants in the context of human disease. So what we wanted to do is understand the genomic basis of human disease, and that would be extremely helpful to understand this third chapter of our path down to personalized medicine. So in general, we, uh, by, and I apologize here if I uh, oversimplify, this is just so that we can understand the approach I will be talking about. In general, we could divide um, the human disease into major categories. Those categories that are highly influenced by a mutation in a gene with a lower influence on the, human, on the environment and some modifier genes, these disorders are rare, simple, monogenic, and with a Mendelian inheritance. So these are rare experiments of Mother Nature that has allowed us to learn about biochemistry and genetics of human disease. However, these are not the common disorders that public health systems have to deal with every day. There is the other chapter, the other category, which are common disorders, uh, where many genes are influence, influence a prediction or risk to uh, developing the disease. That is to say, we need mutations in several genes, and there is a higher, a wider component um, of the uh, environment. These are disorders such as diabetes, cancer, hypertension, asthma, and many others that are extremely expensive and common to, for a health system. So the first ones were pretty much straightforward now. They're pretty much straightforward to go chase and identify the one gene that causes that disease. But the other ones were very much um, way more complex to go and identify those genes that relate to the disorders that I've just mentioned. So that to give you an idea, from the first chapter, th these that are monogenic and simple, when the human genome got started, we knew only 61 genes related to monogenic traits. As we got to know more and more in the human genome, the number increased dramatically. We, we analyzed disease causing genes when the human genome was, uh, was published, and we published about uh, 1,500, 1500 uh, uh, disease-related genes at that time, which was a, tr a significant increase, but nothing to compare to what uh, we have nowadays uh, available. So that's for the monogenic disease. I'd like to focus a little more on the common disorders, on the ones that we see every day, on the ones that each and every one of us might have an affected individual in our own families. How do we go to, uh, about finding those genes and, um, and relating them uh, and translating them into genetic testing and, um, and, and treatment? So back to genetic variation. As I said before, there are genetic variants all over the place. The next challenge was to learn which of these would be good news, resistance to a disease, or bad news, side effects, severe side effects to a drug. And this pretty much has to do with the fact that, uh, with, with the opportunity that emerged that time when the next generation sequencing technologies came on board. Uh, that really make a tremendous difference in the world of genomics because at that time, that, w that made possible to learn thousands and thousands of variants at what time and analyze them mathematically, statistically to identify which uh, variants would be related to the disease. So for example, in this example where we have, this is what we call a Manhattan plot, we have all the, um, all the chromosomes from uh, the human genome aligned here from uh, 1 to 22 20, uh, or to the end, and uh, this is a st uh, statistic significance, and we can observe all of these SNPs analyzed in this case control study, and all of a the sudden there's one SNP 
that shows tremendous association to that certain trait, that certain phenotype, that certain disease. And by this, uh, this, this, what it means is that there is a region in this part of the genome that we need to go dig in and identify what gene is related to the, pop, the, the study that, I, uh, that I'm interested on. And so what happened was that by different mechanisms, mainly by a linkage analysis, we were able to identify some of the initial uh, hu uh, human disease genes uh, associated to common disease. I very much remember this paper, uh, nature, uh, nature Genetics paper from uh, Eric Lander's group, uh, when uh, they identified for the first time PPAR gamma, uh, a mutation in this gene that was related to uh, to type 2 diabetes. That was really primitive at that time how they did it. Uh, the linkage thousands of individuals, three generations of individuals, but that was what opened the door for these association studies, then Crohn's disease, and then uh, again diabetes. But it was in 2005 when uh, for the first time a genome-wide association study show for the first time a gene related to a common disease. And you might remember the cover of science that year that uh, showed uh, complement H factor related to H-related macular degeneration. And this was, by the way, the time when next generation sequencing technologies came up. And so what happened by April 2007 is that the number of genes increased pretty much at the same pace of, as all the genes discovered five years, previously five years, previous five years to this date. That was April. By, um, by later that year, the number increased and we could see disorders such as dyslipidemias, obesity, myocardial infarction, and by August, the list kept growing and growing. By December, the list was this big and continued to grow. So it was clear from 2006 that the new door opened to identifying new genes related to common disease. Today, as of December last year, this is, this is how, this is a report of every single one of the chromosomes where each one of these points, these lollipops, indicate an, uh, an association to a polymorphism that is related to a disease. This is about uh, 1,500 different studies uh, that link 17 different cat uh, disease categories, and this only shows the power of um, a genome-wide association studies and how this has been growing from the beginning in 2007 and how we are now, it's, it, there's no signs of, uh, of stopping but clearly uh, indicate that uh, we'll get more and more information uh, of this kind. Now, this might seem as something as, and as the fact that we've accomplished the task, that we're further down the road, and indeed we are. However, clearly this is not, this doesn't solve the problem. Because many of these uh, studies, many of these results, did not necessarily show something, a result that can be actionable in medicine. Doesn't really necessarily show a pathway that is causing the disease. These results of so many GWAS studies are useful, however, they have some disadvantages, particularly we're talking about rare polymorphisms that are not tackled or identified by GWAS in general. Uh, they have small effect sizes in, in, and there's some missing heritability when the uh, ORs are often small uh, in, in, in many of these uh, GWAS studies. Certainly, assessment of the structural variation um, is not necessarily reflected by GWAS. Uh, GWAS are usually made based on SNPs, not based on any other kind or other kinds of variants. So we're clearly missing out some structural variation, and, um, and most of them have identified signals in non-coding regions. That is to say, it's, n it's hard to find uh, and sometimes it's disappointing to go find what this mutation associated to my disease, to my favorite disease, as a relationship is. So it's not necessarily straightforward. And 
Uh, and as well, there are cases, many cases, that for many common conditions, even multiple GWAS uh, defined variants doesn't necessarily increase the area on, under the curve for um, over the clinical risk factors. So this has been a little uh, exciting for the power that now we have to, to identify associations, but has been a little disappointing in the fact that we get a lot of data, none of it, uh, and, and not all of it, uh, directly actionable to diagnosis or treatment of a disease. Of a disease. However, we have find, we found some principles, and so uh, we've learned some lessons as to how to choose from these results the ones that can be useful to uh, to work practice of me personalized medicine or directly related to medicine. First of all, there are examples where. <laughs> When, um, when there is an available treatment for a disease that can't prevent the disease. In those cases, risk prediction becomes extremely useful, as in the case of type 1 diabetes, where, as you know, this is a, uh, an immune-related disorder where uh, uh, insulin-producing cells in the pancreas are destroyed, and there is not treatment to replenish those destroyed cells. So if we, by the time we have a patient, those cells are pretty much destroyed. If we were to implement immunomodulatory therapy before this happens, then we could prevent the disease. So now there are schemes where uh, uh, family history of type 1 diabetes with a um, uh, um, presence of uh, a genetic variants associated to the disease can identify that individual who might need treatment before the presence of the disease, and this could be extremely helpful. Same happens when we get to reclassify a patient in terms of the risk. There are uh, now different sets of markers that can help us with the clinical features and family history, help us identify um, uh, the level of risk. And this is particularly useful in hospital settings where there are protocols to treat low risk, middle risk, and high risk patients. It wouldn't be the same in terms of uh, uh, interventions nor in terms of cost to be in one group or another. And this is a result that I'm showing here uh, from uh, uh, in the US, recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine, where uh, they observe uh, uh, low risk in green, uh, minimum risk in uh, uh, yellow, and high risk in red. All of these patients receiving a specific protocol due to the risk. And then if we look a little closer, uh, these genetic in, uh, factors, the more we know about genetic factors, turned out that some of the middle risk uh, were really low risk, and some of the middle risk were actually high risk, and, and so that allowed them to classify these patients. And one might think this is only a few patients that got reclassified. Yes, but if it were us, I'll be 100% uh, of the case, and we would like to be classified properly so that we receive the right personalized medicine, personalized medical care. So this is important, and once again, I'd like to point out the fact that uh, uh, studying different populations matter. In the same way, there's been um, SNPs associated to hypertension, and here I'm showing one, several SNPs related to hypertension in the population. This is in the AGT gene, and um, when we analyze the Mexican population, uh, this is work from Eros Balan in my lab, uh, we show that actually only two of them were uh, significantly uh, uh, related to hypertension in the, me in, in the Mexican population. So once again, you can't just copycat, copy and paste one inf information from one discovered in one population without validation in the other where you want to apply um, this, um, uh, this knowledge. Now, so, so, so um, when there is an available treatment, when there is reclassification, but also when we can classify the disease, uh, that's when GWAS studies become uh, useful. And, and I won't go in much in detail, I'm just going to say that there are clear examples for the Modi kind of diabetes, uh, where uh, there's been uh, proxy biomarkers that allows us to make the right diagnosis, which is important in this uh, autosomal dominant disease, because uh, they're usually confused with type 1, type 2 diabetes, 
And actually, these respond much better to sulfonylurea as opposed to, as opposed to metformin or insulin. So it matters for the patient to be properly classified, and GWAS studies had led us to to do things like that. And, and finally, the fourth category that I believe it's important from GWAS studies is when variants might become uh, indicators for closing monitoring or alternative therapies. And this is the case for, there are several cases I just chose for today, uh, the statin uh, caused myopathy. And as you know, uh, those individuals who receive uh, statins for cholesterol hypercholesterolemia, uh, some of them might get uh, affection to muscles. And this might get, in some cases, it's very severe, uh, producing a disease called rhabdomyolysis that, might may, that may lead to uh, uh, renal insufficiency. And if that is the case, that complicates things very severely. So there has been an, um, an, an, a single non-coding SNP in this solute carrier 1B1 that has been associated to 4.5-fold increase in the risk of myopathy uh, when a minor allele is extremely frequent. And we see here how having um, this risk um, risk allele, we see here that the uh, cumulative percentage of patients having myopathy increases, but if you are homozygous for the C version of SNP, the risk increases tremendously, and uh, we can now detect those patients on, on the red curve, and so much so that this has been already turned into public policy, and there was uh, three months ago an update of the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consumption Guidelines that is uh, used by FDA in the United States, indicating that there are different uh, drug use recommendations uh, for whether whether the individual is TT for normal myopathy risk, TC for intermediate myopathy risk, or CC for high myopathy risk. And there are alternative therapies, and this is one of the cases where uh, information from GWAS studies turn out to discover a very useful, uh, uh, life-saving, actually, um, uh, polymorphism. But, so, uh, as I said before, uh, this only makes the point of uh, uh, how to make use of, of such a great amount of data that's now available. I'd like to come back for a minute to the point of the importance of um, the importance of analyzing different populations, disease genes in different populations, because um, disease uh, alleles that are common in one population might be rare in others. And that might have a serious implication for public health. I'll be giving you two examples out of type 2 diabetes. This diabetes being these great epidemics around the world, and I will be showing you examples uh, of genes that have, that have been crucial for understanding diabetes that were published uh, within the last two or three months, and I'd like to bring it to your attention for the reasons that I just mentioned. The first one comes from a population, namely the Mexican population, where diabetes as the non-Hispanic whites in the U.S. So Mexico has a very high prevalence of diabetes amongst our populations. So what we did here with the Sigma strategy was, uh, a consortium was to analyze 9.2 million SNPs in over 800 Mexican divided in two groups, uh, diabetes and non-diabetes. And what happened after several years and millions of dollars invested in this study was that it was uh, the identification of a new, a novel low uh, associated to type 2 diabetes in between these solute carriers, uh, 16A11, 16A13, and turn out to be extremely important. The reason why this is important is because each haplotype copy is associated with a 20% increase in diabetes mellitus. 
This is extremely important for public health, identifying in a population a gene that has the power to increase 20% uh, risk to diabetes, and that I'm sure uh, counts for part of the burden of the Mexican uh, uh, is, uh, prevalence of diabetes. Here we see, uh, similar to the uh, Manhattan plot I mentioned about, this is the region of the DNA that uh, is involved with, uh, with, uh, with the, the gene here that is associated to the disease, and, um, and I'm not moving it, it's just moving it by itself, I assure you, uh, but uh, clearly there is something here that is high, showing a very high uh, uh, signal. When we remove these samples, these SNPs from the sample, the whole signal disappears, and in this region of the genome, we can observe here there are two uh, solid carrier genes A13 and A11, and it turns out that it was uh, this solid carrier 16A11, the one that accounts for five SNPs, four, uh, four uh, missense mutations and one, uh, and one neutral mutation that I'm showing here. Um, these are these are presenting and uh, together in this haplotype. When you find them all together, there's 20% increase in risk to diabetes. So what was interesting here is that they went back and compared this haplotype to the Thousand Genome Project you might remember we talked about. And what happened when we compare, when they compare these, um, these uh, a haplotype to other populations from the thousand uh, from a thousand genomes was that this haplotype, say the normal, the wild type, pretty much shows in African, European, Asian, and even Mexican population. But when we get to the high risk haplotype, that's pretty much absent in Africa, in Europe, somehow present in Asia, but very high very prevalent in Mexicans, that is 28 percent. When it was assessed in the population from the Sigma consortium, it turned out that this increased even more. So it's 30 percent in the population, out of which they selected by ancestry, Mexican ancestry, and that haplotype increased to 48 percent. Clearly, a major finding that will have an impact in a major disorder such as type 2 diabetes in the Mexican populations, which, by the way, this haplotype was traced down to the Neanderthal contribution to our today's uh, uh, um, uh, genome. Uh in Mexico. So that's one example as to how important it is to study different populations, particularly when there is a higher incidence of a common disease. There's another example that is as dramatic that I'd like to share with you that was just very recently published by my good friend uh, David Schuller in Boston uh, with the help of uh, investigators from around the world with their ana analyzed uh, 100, 150,000 individuals from four different ancestries and then they identify a gene that is already associated to diabetes. However, they found two or three mutations that are nonsense mutations, that is, that stops the message of the gene, and what produces is a truncated protein or an unstable RNA. And what happened with this, uh, with, uh, with these two mutations particularly, that are found in this SYNC T8, which, which is a SYNC transporter in the pancreas, where in the islets where insulin is produced, these are a protein, uh, membrane protein pumping sync in the pancreas. And what happens is that in the absence of this protein or truncated, or presence of truncated protein, uh, carriers had a 65% reduced risk to diabetes. Again, big deal. Because having a mutation that protects to, from a common disorder, having no side effects from that mutation, that is a clear uh, in vivo example of, uh, of uh, a potential uh, therapy for a disease like type 2 diabetes. So that these loss of function mutations provide strong evidence that haploid insufficiency of this gene 
protects against is suggesting that uh, innovation of this protein, this zinc channel, ha might be a therapeutic strategy for type 2 diabetes prevention. That's not only treatment, but prevention. If you can imagine having a pill that blocks this channel and prevents diabetes, that would be just dramatic. And that came from those 150,000 individuals, those two mutations came from the European side. And here you see where these mutations came from, from the European uh, cohorts, and it turns out that they came mainly from Finland. Uh, and actually, when you see the uh, prevalence of these mutation in Finland, it's actually here in Botnia, where uh, this mutation probably originated, uh, and we can see frequencies up to uh, 0.7 and higher that uh, really made this component help us to identify one of the major contributors to type 2 diabetes. So this pretty much accounts for how we are learning uh, and understanding the biology of, the, of a disease. Um, and now we want to do uh, a routine whole genome sequencing. This is so that we can analyze both the structure, the function of the human, human genome, but also the molecular mechanisms of disease. And more and more we can get to do that, and we're getting closer to doing that. From the first human genome that costs a billion dollars to sequence, to the thousand genomes that we're all aiming for, with the help of all these machines that you and I use every day in our laboratories, we're almost there, getting closer, uh, to a uh, figure that could be uh, useful to bring routine genomic analysis to uh, the clinical arena. And, and, and I'm sure you're familiarized with this uh, trend as to how uh, DNA sequencing costs have dropped, particularly with the uh, emergence of uh, next generation technologies and how this is getting us closer to being able to use genetic uh, whole genome sequencing in a routine basis. So whole genome and exome sequencing in the clinical practice be are beginning to to be used for certain very specific uh, uh, cases, as in the case of uh, seeking for germline mutations in cases of monogenic disorders. We can only imagine having a rare disorders, a disorder in a kid and a non-affected individual, uh, a sibling, and the parents, it'll be easier to compare uh, a whole genome from uh, all of them and identify what mutation is causing the disease on that individual. So in order to do that, clearly uh, uh, guidelines, in, at least in the U.S., is that currently it's indicated to identify variants related to Mendelian disorders after known single genome gene candidates have been ruled out. So we still need to do our homework and check for the candidate genes first, and I try to identify the mutation, but if that doesn't happen, and we have to analyze several genes, and that multi-gene testing approach is prohibitively expensive, then that's when we have two, these two new tools, whether it's whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing, both of them with different advantages or disadvantages, depending as to what is it that we want to use, whether it's coverage, covering exons, uh, certainly uh, whole exon sequencing costs less and, um, and offers, is offered for, by many laboratories. Now, if we want to analyze the structural variants and other kinds of details, then maybe whole genome exon, uh, whole genome sequencing might be the answer. But in all of these cases, it is imperative that we gather information from family history, we systematically clinically evaluate patient's phenotype, and we search medical literature and databases, and of course, get informed consent. So what I'm saying with this point is this is not magic. This is not just use it for everyone. There are clear indications for very specific cases where we can use this. This is one for uh, germline mutations, but also uh, whole genome, whole exome sequence have been extremely useful in the search for uh, somatic mutations in cancer. And as you know, cancer is a product of uh, genetic mutations in a cell that accumulates several other mutations down the road uh, while it forms a tumor. 
And uh, with that, and with the efforts uh, from the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, now some patients with cancer can um, use next generation sequence to improve tumor classification, diagnosis, and management. And indeed, this is uh, this is a really important uh, diagnostic tool. Uh, so we used to have, you know, the uh, radiographic imaging now and, and biopsies as well. Now we can make use of uh, whole genome analysis, and this is a circus plot where we can analyze all of the chromosomes at once. We can see each, the whole genome in, in the outer circle, and then we can layer in the different uh, variants that we can we want to that we want to analyze, I just want to point out your attention to these purple lines that indicate translocations from one chromosome to another. The reason I'm doing this is because I'd like to show you an example from my own laboratory where we analyze a series of uh, women with breast cancer. This is uh, 22 breast uh, tumors that we analyze with whole genome and whole exome sequencing, some of them with both, some of them with whole exome only, and we identify the different patterns of mutation from, um, from uh, these patients, but I want to call your attention on patient number 22, particularly in that patient where by looking very carefully into the different mutations, we were able to identify a key translocation that actually uh, fuses MAGI3 with AKT3 genes by a translocation producing a uh, constitutively active uh, uh, transcription factor, that is the kinase. And by doing that, we confirm the structure of this translocation in the patient, and, uh, and once we have it, we created a plasmid with that fusion protein that we, uh, fusion gene that we transfected into epithelial cells from rats, and a few hours after we transfected this, we started seeing foci tumor coming up from these epithelial cells. So now, this is open in the door for, we're now using chemical banks to see what chemical can block this fusion protein as a new treatment for this kind of breast cancer and will turn out to be extremely powerful. And like this, there are other examples in the literature where we now can use uh, uh, mutation analysis to predict what kind of tumors will be sensitive to a specific uh, kind of uh, uh, treatments. And this is part of the hot areas in genomic medicine uh, and personalized medicine. This is, these are some of the successes that make us think that we'll get there. Um, so cancer genomics is one. Of course, and, and I won't talk in de into detail, but pharmacogenomics is another one, as w along with uh, ultra-rare uh, genetic disease diagnostics that I mentioned a minute ago. And certainly, and again, I will be not talking about this today, but certainly prenatal and newborn genetic analysis is coming into the picture, and this has whole other technical, ethical, and legal challenges that will need to have its own discussion. But uh, for pharmacogenomics, though I won't get in detail, I would like to just point out that uh, this is an area where um, public policy has come in place timely. So as we know, not everyone responds the same. We all respond differently to similar stimuli, and that is very clear. And I don't know whether you were the ones from the right or the ones from the left, but if you were to be the uh, grand pass reaction, Boy, you might want to know, to, you, you might want to have known beforehand whether you will have an, an adverse reaction to this stimuli. And this happens with medication. As you know, uh, patients with, with the same disease receiving the same treatment, some patients will not respond, very few. Some patients will have a bad side effect, and most of the patients will have a good response to the drug. However, we want to identify more and more, then we identify polymorphisms that can predict who will have inside an adverse reaction. These adverse reactions are no minor thing. Adverse reactions can make us lose a kidney, can make us spend several days in the emergency room or even in intensive uh, units. So not only are they life-threatening, some of them, but are extremely expensive. So if we were to have a test uh, 
and identify who is at risk before giving it this drug, this will be of a great advantage. But the point I want to make with this pharmacogenomics is how this uh, personalized medicine, it's coming to public policy mainstream. And this is the website from the, uh, from the FDA in the U.S. where there is a clear mandate to change a drug labeling in those drugs where a test is available and a therapeutic guideline is available. So the FDA has syndicated that over 140 drugs uh, need to change a uh, uh, label to warn the consumer of the existence of these drugs. And this is not rare medications. These are very common medications that I'm sure you and I uh, have faced, and those most, if not all of them, are sold in every pharmacy in Spain as well as in Mexico and the US. So to have an idea of these drugs where uh, the law now indicates that they need to change a, a label and warn the uh, consumer, we can see that there are drugs for infectious diseases, for oncology, for psychiatry, uh, 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 GI infections, uh, in many other areas. I don't mean for you to read them all, I just want to give you an idea that there are over 140 of them um, of, all different, um, of all different disciplines, and this is getting to the market with the appropriate regulatory element. So, we're getting close to uh, now uh, uh, analyzing uh, whole genome, as I said, but we would like to have not only sequencing, but here's where challenges begin. We need routine analysis. Analysis with way more complicated. How do we make sense of the sequence in all these five different changes? In other words, how do we go from having a sequence to advise our patient? How do we make sense of this? And we heard, uh, and we heard a minute ago uh, during the opening that analysis of such a huge amount of data uh, we were, we heard from Federico, this is a major challenge, and, and, and no kidding, there are major efforts around the world as to how do we go about managing uh, big data. This is one of the major challenges that sectors such as financial sectors, commercial sectors, they have been able to get a hold of managing um, uh, big data. But genomics still not there. We need to have the right appropriate tools to make sense of data in a way that a doctor in their office can make sense and may write a prescription uh, in personalized medicine. Another challenge that we have to still work on is a better association between genotype and phenotype. And for that, I will refer to this new initiative that came out of Harvard, uh, Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, that basically pulls together, right now, over 200 individuals, groups, universities, and centers from around the world, uh, gathering genetic and clinical uh, information from their patients to propel discovery of mechanisms of disease. This is a major initiative that I will urge you to be part of it, to, to, because this will be a win-win situation where we will be able to, uh, to get a lot of information done. And they will develop, as part of this uh, effort, uh, applications that interfaces that will make it easier for us to analyze the data. So just so as, the, as we do it in the iPhone for other things, there will be applications coming up. One of the partners that just announced coming on board with Global Alliance was Google, and they have committed to produce Google Genomics for, as an interface for making sense of genomics and uh, phenotypes. So there are uh, several challenges still to go on for, and I would like to close by summarizing briefly uh, some of the challenges that I foresee in the next future that we will need to tackle so that we make personalized medicine a reality. And I can probably categorize these challenges in four different areas. The first area would be the technical area, the one that we need to get a hold of in the laboratory, in the computer sector. 
which is mainly the storage, processing, and quality control management of DNA sequencing. Remember DNA, we cannot just store my sequence in an Excel sheet. We need supercomputing and big files to make sense of this amount of data. We need to establish the standards for the appropriate use of this technology. This is the very first time we begin to use genomics, whole genome, for clinical care, and there are no established standards that will need to be uh, uh, harmonized and defined through all the users. In this same area, interpretation of vast amounts of sequence data, if we bring a whole data set of DNA to our doctor, may, and most likely they won't be able to know what to do with it, so there need to be ways to interpret this amount of data and translate it into actionable applications into medicine. The second chapter of challenges I like to refer to are the ones uh, more related to the clinic, and that is number one, training physicians and other health professionals to use appropriately the uh, information from the human genome. In the same way, we need effective genetic counseling and communication of results to patients. We need to make sure that we convey the right information at the right time and not even giving additional non-solicited information that might harm a patient as opposed to helping them. And of course, the integration of genomic uh, results and clinical decision support into electronic medical records. If you could only imagine that we had our patient's DNA in the electronic medical record, and as new things get developed that could appear directly in the electronic medical record as new recommendations for that very patient, that will be really cool. That will be really medical, uh, personalized medicine from DNA as new information emerges. And of course, there is another chapter. A major chapter that was mentioned this morning as well that has to do with cost-effective studies companion with other approaches and evaluation of clinical endpoints and healthcare costs. It is not as easy as having a new test and bringing it to the market because that doesn't do the trick. Economic cost-effective uh, uh, studies are the ones that determine in real life what comes to life and what not. And the last chapter I want to talk about in terms of challenges are the ones that refer to, uh, to uh, uh, payment and third-party reimbursement. Someone has to pay for this. In countries like this, usually the public service will be paying for this uh, uh, testing and interventions. But the situation is different in different countries. So there has to be guidelines for payment and reimbursement. And in the same way, uh, social issues, ethical issues will have to be put in place. Uh, and one of them that has uh, been a pretty hot in discussion is the informed consent process. Usually we ask it for a single gene, and we need to think a way to have a wider uh, consent form for things that we don't know yet and will come up. And finally, Finally, we will need education to patients, clinicians, and the public. If we don't get engagement from all of them, it will be very hard to get personalized medicine as a, uh, as a tool for everyone. So in summary, it was, uh, it was uh, last decade, last uh, century, when it seemed somehow blurry that uh, the human genome, at the beginning of the human genome project, would be helpful for uh, human health. At the end of the Human Genome Project, it was clear that there were some disease-related gene, disease genes, and hopefully we will be able to get to the patient. Now, a couple of years ago, when uh, we all got together from major centers in the U.S. and established a, um, a path towards developing personalized medicine into the clinic, it was clear now that there is a path as to how do we get there. Now we have so long-hanging fruits, pharmacogenomics, cancer genomics, that gives us the idea that we will get there. And hopefully, uh, a few years down the road, it will be a much clearer image as to how we will be able to serve our patients uh, uh, 
uh, uh, properly. And so just in closing, I'd like to add, as I promised to my good friend uh, uh, Jaime, that when we met uh, five years, uh, ten years ago, we were establishing the National Institute of Genomic Medicine. This is the groundbreaking ceremony in September 2005 when I was director of the institute and uh, my good friend Francis Collins, uh, director of the National Institute of Genomic uh, Genome Research uh, and led leader of the Human Genome Project, our Secretary of Health, and uh, Professor Sobran, we all put this first stone to what was to be the National Institute of Genomic Medicine that years later turned out to be now our leading institution in Mexico for genomic medicine for public health. And on that point, uh, I believe that there has been a long way, uh, a, a, a month of work done at this point, but indeed this is promising times and I have no questions that personalized medicine will become a reality and we all have an important role to play so that that becomes feasible thank you very much for your attention